Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. Uh, as you notice, Brother Joe is not here. He is at uh, Body of Faith Church. That's uh, James Darby's church. You know, we use Brother James Darby for many, many events here at Believers Fellowship. He kindly uh, and seems to always uh, come and minister over here. So he's asked Brother Joe to minister at his church. So it's about time we repay the favor. Amen. And so he's been asking for him for a while. So he's preaching this morning uh, over there. He kind of let me know the time clock that he'll be preaching, which is a little late. I said, if I had to preach over there, they'd have to put a hamburger right there on the pulpit because he'll be going way past 12. So uh, anyway. Well, this morning I wanted to tell you about this man that was marooned on the island for 20 years. His boat that he was on kind of hit this deserted island and nobody was there and he survived for 20 years. And finally a boat came by to rescue him and so they got him, put him on board and as the boat was going away from the island, the people in the boat told the guy, they said, look, there's three grass huts on that island that you lived in. I thought you said you lived there by yourself for 20 years. He said, I did. He said, that first hut was my house and that second hut was my church. And they said, well, what's the third hut? He said, that's the church I used to belong to. <laughs> so. so no matter what, you'll always have something that won't be what you like, amen? Even if you had a church all by yourself, you'd probably leave it and say it's something wrong here because we're not right. So, you know, there is a misconcept uh, concept about church and Christianity and, and things. And uh, this morning I wanted to look at a verse that only contains, and the title of the message is, Thy Kingdom or My Kingdom Come. That, that verse should have been back up there if you can kind of go back. That should be before that. That didn't, there you go. Matthew 6.10. <clears throat> it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. 14 words that Jesus spoke as part of his, what a lot of people call the Lord's Prayer, it's probably better called the Disciples' Prayer. Uh, when he taught his disciples how to pray, these were 14 important words that were in that prayer that I think will revolutionize our life if we'll really concentrate on that. Now, we've said it before. We've said the Lord's Prayer before, but did we really know the full impact of when we were saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Did we really know in our hearts what we were really praying or saying or meaning or what Jesus really was saying and meaning when he made these few little words come off the page? And of course, circled up there is really the key issue here. If you want to know why we don't do this verse, it's because of those two words because we replace that. We really want my kingdom to come and my will to be done. That's what we fight against on a daily, hourly, minutely basis. And so that's where we get the title of the message, Thy Kingdom or My Kingdom Come. Because it's really important to us for our kingdom to come. And it's really important for us for our will to be done and not so much sometimes for God's kingdom and God's will. And so with that in mind, we need to see what Jesus really had in mind here. You know, it's so important to know and realize that we all as Christians ought to want God's kingdom to come. We want more people to be saved, more people to come to Christ, more people to surrender the ministry, more people to grow closer to the Lord, more people to serve the Lord in church. We just want His kingdom to come more. You said, where's His kingdom now? Well, most of His kingdom is running in our hearts. You know, you've seen, you've heard people explain the gospel to you. It's where you get off the throne of your life and you put Christ in the throne of your life so that he runs the show. He runs your kingdom. And as a group, we're a church as a kingdom. And then, yes, the kingdom is in heaven as well. And there will be a future kingdom. But there is the kingdom that's going on here on earth and it's in the hearts of those who he rules. Does he rule your heart? Has he taken over your kingdom? Well, let's see, because we want to look at this. You know, the Talmud, a, a, a famous a Jewish writings, and not the scripture, but boy, as close to scripture probably as you could get for Jews to, to say this is our customs and tradition. The Talmud says this, quote, if a prayer does not name the kingdom of God, it's not a prayer. It's not even a prayer. Why? Why? Because all your prayers should be thy kingdom. 
And I often wonder sometimes, is that why our prayers don't get answered? Because the kingdom, my prayer is about my kingdom and not his. How many prayers are about my kingdom? Fix me, get me, help me, da 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 They're all about my kingdom many times and not about his kingdom. And we wonder why the prayers don't get answered. Because in his prayer, he told us the model prayer is for his kingdom, not mine, to be done. Praise the Lord many times. He, he does minister to my little kingdom. You know, I have a home and a family and responsibilities. I have this little bitty kingdom. But his kingdom is what's important. And praise the Lord that he even ministers, even takes the time to minister to even us. Jesus said this. In an answer, he said, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Because he was asked, are you a king? And he answered, but my kingdom is not of this world. And I believe Jesus was not only telling him that his kingdom is not of this world. He was telling, I believe, kind of underline that there is some similarities that people know about kingdoms that they could relate to his kingdom. Because many times we don't look at Christianity in the realm of a kingdom. We looked at it as commandments, service, prayer, Bible study, and those are all aspects of walking with Christ. But do you look at your walk and your life as how it fits into a kingdom? Well, I believe there's three aspects that we can look at this morning to where we can get the full, I think, impact of what Jesus was saying. First of all, there's the fundamentals of the kingdom. And we're, well, go back on that. It should just have the two. It's getting a little ahead. Just the two titles, America and God's kingdom. We're going to look and compare these two kingdoms as we... See, now, now I know right off the bat you're saying, wait, Brother Tim, you don't know your government very well. America does not have a kingdom because we don't have a king. I taught U.S. history five, six years in public school. I know quite well it's not a kingdom. But it has similarities of a kingdom because it is a nation and it is ruled, obviously not by a king, but it is, there's some ways, since we know America best, here in this room we can see how God's kingdom works. First of all, that's not even the right that page. It should say it has rulers. So that if you can go back to that page, whoever's, anybody back there, back to uh, the first one should be has rulers. All right, there we go. Now, now I can click. Uh, it's not going up. So, <laughs> If you can run it back there, that would be great, to where it says has rulers. So the first deal is America has rulers and the kingdom has the ruler. It only has one ruler, and that's God himself. In America, yeah, we have multiple rulers. We have, a, we have that nation run by president, congress, and the whole works. But it is based on there's some ruling going on. But in God's kingdom, there is ruling going on, but it only comes from one person, and that's God. The next one, I'm scared to touch it, so I may let you. <laughs> has rules based on a book that's called the Constitution. And God's kingdom is based on the book for us, and it's based on the book. The rules are in this book. And we as a nation should go back to the Constitution for our way of living, and then with God we go back to His book. And of course, our nation should use the book, <laughs> as well as a book, the Constitution. The next one is, there are consequences for breaking the rules in this kingdom in America. But most people don't realize there are consequences for breaking God's kingdom rules. A lot of people say, I don't have to obey that. There's no consequences. Well, there is consequences. You may see your consequences in breaking America's laws quicker than maybe you see with your physical eyes what God is doing with you. Yes, the punishment was on the cross, but there's still consequences for when we disobey God. Now, a lot of people get away from this. They say, well, there's not consequences for me because that's not how I see that particular rule in the Bible. I, I don't see it that way. I, that commandment means this to me. I know it means this to other people, and faithfulness means this to some people, and it means this to me, and being obedient means this to me, and it means that to other people. It's all how you interpret it. Okay, drive 90 miles an hour down the freeway today. Have the police officer in the America kingdom pull you over and say, you were going 95 and a 55, I'm going to give you a ticket. And you say, that's not how I interpret 55. <laughs> the way I interpret 55 is meaning 55 to 100 
is that's what that means. It's a window to me. That's how I see it. And the police officer said, well, see it this way. Sign this pad right here for a ticket. Because I don't care how you see it. The law says it's this way, and it doesn't matter how you see it. But Christians in God's kingdom, they always seem to want to say, here's how the rules apply to me. Oh, I'm, I should have let you. Go ahead. I'm going to let you from here. I was going to... I was going to take the, the power in the button. I just couldn't resist. So. The next one is citizens try to change the rules in America kingdom. You know, we're always saying this was the law back then, but we want it to change because times change. But you know what Christians have done throughout the ages? That book's getting a little old. Let's change it. Let's change how that's just for back then. And even in God's kingdom, some of its citizens try to change or manipulate it. The next one is that citizens support the kingdom. In America, citizens support the kingdom, and God makes his kingdom to where, yes, he provides to us, and then we provide uh, our tithes and our offerings to support his kingdom here. Now, I would not dare ask in this congregation to raise your hand if you financially support God's kingdom. But I will do this publicly. I will ask a raise of hands if you in this room financially, faithfully, regularly support your America kingdom, raise your hand. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, we do not have a prison ministry at Believer's Fellowship right now. But you'll be the first to start it because some of you didn't raise your hand, which means you do not regularly, faithfully support your America kingdom. And you're going to go to prison for a long time if you're caught. Did you know Al Capone was not put in prison for any of those murderous things that he did? He was put in prison because they could only catch him on one thing, not supporting his America kingdom. And they put him in jail, and he died in jail for tax evasion because he didn't support his America kingdom. So if you didn't raise your hand, you're in trouble. It's only a matter of time. They're going to catch you. And I'll guarantee you, your American kingdom support is well, 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 well above 10%. Now, would 100% of the people raise their hand that they support God's kingdom? I know what you're thinking, but brother Tim, I have to do the other. But that does mean we would rather support America's kingdom than God's. When God's kingdom is to be financially supported as well. The next one is that citizens pledge allegiance to the kingdom in both. You know, in school, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Meaning, I am going to be loyal to America I'm not going to be treasonous. And did you know that treason in America, supporting the enemy, is punishable by death? That's how serious our kingdom is to treason. You know, it says in James chapter 4, he who is a friend of the world is an enemy, treasonous, to God. We're a terrorist. We're aiding and abetting the enemy. We would not dare do that in the American kingdom. But if we're a friend of this world and the world's ways, we make ourselves an enemy to God's kingdom. The next one is citizens are protected by the kingdom in America. And they're protected by the kingdom of the king. You know, it was amazing that, that that captain of that ship that was hijacked by those Somali pirates, one man out there on sea taken as captive, and this nation would send three American ships. Do you imagine how much it costs to send three ships staffed with people out to one location and the helicopters and the Navy SEALs and all the communications and all that that was done on that day to save and protect one kingdom citizen? Why? Because he was an American. 
And if you're an American citizen, our nation says we will protect you at all costs. Now, if you're part of God's kingdom and you're worried about things, God's greater than the United States government and he protects his citizens. The next thing about kingdom living is citizens respect or represent the kingdom. No matter where you go as an American, even off this soil, you represent America. And no matter where you go as an individual, if you're a Christian, you represent God's kingdom. The next one is America has enemies and God's kingdom has enemies. The world, the flesh, the devil is always against us. And then America keeps records of its legal citizens. And God does too. And nobody will be an illegal citizen in heaven. You say, I'll fake it. I'll twist it. No. If you're not born again, you will not be a legal citizen of heaven. Matter of fact, you won't be allowed in. He says, ah, maybe the records won't be that good. Yeah, right. See, uh, you may be able to live in America and not be a legal citizen. But in God's kingdom, the books are perfect. And nobody will be allowed access to that. Can you see just a little bit about fundamentals of kingdom? When God said, I want my kingdom to come. You see how what all he was probably entailing because people knew about all of these things in, in national kingdoms but now they had God himself telling them about how his kingdom works. And then there's the first place of the kingdom. That's the second aspect we want to look at. And in Matthew 6, 10, it says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in order for his kingdom to be existing in our hearts, you've got to turn your will over to him and say, I want your will to be done, not mine. You know, Jesus in the garden prayed twice about this. You know, he was facing the death of the cross. And he was saying, if any way, any other way would be possible, but not my will, but yours be done to the Father. Jesus knew what this prayer would mean, and he used that to say, Lord, your will, not my will. So if we're going to live in his kingdom, we've got to be doing his will, not our will, and here's where we face it again. Will it be his kingdom or my kingdom? Will it be his will or my will? That's where all the Christian life battle is right there. Whose will will win out? And if you have a child that's a rebellious child, a strong-willed child then your battle is the same way. Whose will will win? And that's the same way with God. He has some strong-willed children. He has some strong-willed people that aren't his children that just will not bend the knee and say, no, it's going to be my way. Now, if you wonder what did he mean when he said he wants his will done on earth as it is in heaven then you must go to heaven and get a little glimpse of what's going on. So I went to Revelation. And you, there's a lot of heavenly activity going on in that book. God's telling angels, pour out this vial. He's telling other angels, you know, break this seal. And he's telling other angels, blow this trumpet. And there's three things you can find out when you look at those angels going. Let's look at the first one. It is to be done immediately because it's a top priority. And if you want to know what each of these three are going to be, it's the same things you want out of your children that God wants out of His. When you ask your children to do something, you want it done immediately. Or you would say, do this sometime this month. I mean, if you say that, that's okay. But if you say, do this, you imply you want it done right then. And that's what this is. It is to be done immediately. Now, you go to Revelation and read all those commandments the Lord are giving all those angels. I never saw one angel when the Lord said, blow that trumpet, and the angels say, when I'm good and ready, I'll blow her. 
I never saw one angel say, I'm busy right now. I've got school. I've got a report. I've got papers. I've got a job. I've got a career. I've got house cleaning. I'll do it when I get ready. Not once. The angel God said, blow her and blown. Break that seal, boom, this angel broke it. Pour out that vow, boom, it got done right then and there. Do you realize that if you're doing, not doing something God wants you to do, now that's disobedience. If you don't think that's true, then I want your child to go to you and say, clean your room, you'll say, when I'm ready to do it, I'll do it. Now you wouldn't take that, but that's exactly what you tell your heavenly father. I'll do it when I'm good and ready to do it. Now here's a better one. I'll do it after I prayed about it. Well, if he tells you to do it, do it. You don't have to pray about that. It's already in his word to do it. Now, the second one is, well, we go to the verse that kind of capitalizes on, seek ye third, I mean, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. See, I have some things necessary for my little part of my kingdom. I, I do have responsibilities. I have a family. I've got to work, I've got to provide, I've got to pay bills, I've got to do this. I mean, there's a lot of things I've got to do in my little bit of kingdom. But God's saying, put my kingdom first. And I'll add all those other things that you need. I know you need things in your particular little bitty kingdom, so to speak, your life. I'll take care of that kingdom. You put my kingdom first. It's not that he wouldn't want to take care of our little bitty kingdom, which is really not a kingdom, but it's our lives. He's just saying, put my kingdom first. The next one is, is it's to be done completely because it's worth doing right. Whatever God commands you to do in his word and whatever you're doing to serve him, you ought to do it completely and a good job. Why? Because he deserves that. Are you doing a great job for him? Completely? Completely? Are you obeying him completely? Do you know that's where Solomon was in trouble? Do you know that's what the Bible says against Solomon? It says in, that, in, in, in 1 Kings or 2 Kings, it says he did not follow the Lord fully. That's what it said. <laughs> it doesn't say anybody didn't follow the Lord. It just said he didn't follow him fully, but that's what he did wrong. It was partial obedience, which is, in a sense, disobedience. So when you tell your child, clean your room, and they said, I cleaned half of it, you would say, that's fine, at least you got some of it done. No, you'd say, get it all clean. But that's how we go back to God. Did you obey all this? No, but I obeyed a whole lot of it. You expect more from your children than that, and so does he. The third thing he means when he says on earth as it is in heaven is it will be done willingly because you love him. Don't you want your children to do it with a good attitude? When you ask them, you command them to do something, you want them to roll their eyes and say, no, I gotta do that again. And that's what God's children do so much. I gotta go to church, do I gotta read my Bible, do I gotta tithe, do I gotta do other stuff, I'll do it, but I'm like, that's where a lot of God's children lie. God says, do it willingly, lovingly. Don't you want that child to have a good attitude toward that? That's what God's saying. You don't see any of that type of behavior with the angels when they're asked to do anything. God says, I want it to be done on earth like it's already being done in heaven. You should be doing it willingly. Why? Because it's out of love. How many people went over to the boyfriends or girlfriends house to visit and say here I am I know I gotta be over here to see you again <laughs> bless God I had to drive get up chain drive all the way over here okay I'm sitting on the couch go ahead and talk visit share whatever you gotta share in an hour I'm leaving bless God and I hope you give me credit for being over here <laughs> you're broke up that evening I can guarantee you that that's, that's all it is but you know that's how people do God. I'm in your house. That's one hour. Hope you realize that sacrifice so much. I'll be out of here in a little bit and get home. Good. I got to come back next time. And that's not out of love. That's no love relationship there. God's looking for willing, lovingly. You bankrupt heaven for me. You died on the cross for me. 
I love you. I want to hear about you. I want to know more about you. I love you. I want to serve you. Willing obedience. And then the last one is not only the fundamentals of the kingdom and the first place of the kingdom, the last thing is the future of the kingdom. If you pull that next still up, it says that the word come in the aorist active imperative could be translated, your kingdom come now. His kingdom's already gone in my heart. He's already ruling here, hopefully. But I want his future kingdom. That kingdom where I'm going to be serving him in his presence. Do you, do you realize that serving him is not going to stop? If you're not serving him here, why are you feel like you're going to serve him there? Because we serve him forever. But we're going to be serving him face to face. And I want that kingdom to come even now. The, the next verse there in Revelations 22, 20, that's, that's the next to the last verse in the entire Bible. It says, yes, I am coming quickly, Jesus says. And then it says, come, Lord Jesus. Come on. I want your kingdom to even come now. First Thessalonians 1.10 says, and to wait for his son from heaven. To wait for his son from heaven. You can go ahead and click that one up. We're waiting. We're anticipating even that future kingdom. You know, because part of the two things that focus on this future kingdom is its future importance and then its future impact. See, a lot of people don't think too much about the future unless it's about their future up till the time they die. A lot of people think about that. Am I going to be financially? How can I do it? Will my health hold out? Will my money hold out? We think about the future, but usually the future up to death. A lot of people aren't thinking too much on a daily basis about their future after death, what all's going on there. But we will be. You know, I may have, I think I did tell this story. I won't tell it again because it relates to this. Probably about 10 years ago, I had this wild idea. We lived in Waller. We had this horse. And I said, you know what? I told Rebecca, I said, I want to ride this horse in the parade in a parade. She said, not that we had this old horse. I mean, he came over with Christopher Columbus. I mean, he was, he was old. She said, he's not a parade horse, you know, and I basically said, well, he will be this weekend. <laughs> I don't know if this was one of my bucket list things. I don't know. I just, I just, and I said, Hannah's small enough. She can ride up on the horse with me and we're just going to do it. So we, off we went to Round Top, Texas to ride in that parade. And then we got there, never done it before, didn't know what to do. And so we went over there and they had this registration table and nobody explained nothing. There were just sheets of paper laying out there. Big sheets of paper with all these blanks on it. And it's like, I ain't got time for that. I just want to ride in the parade and just be done. So it just said float description, float uh, sponsorship, uh, details of the float, da da yada, 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 yada. And I didn't do that. I just wrote on a pen, I can remember this day, Hannah and Dad on a horse. And just turned it in. I said, I just, give me my card. They gave me my number. Get in line. And off I went. You know, it's like, that's, that's done. Let's just do it and have fun. So off we go. And Rachel and Rebecca were kind of spectators trying to watch at different parts of the deal. So we get through almost the whole deal. And kind of about midway, we make this turn. And Hannah and I, we notice there's this big crowd. I mean, there have been crowds before. This was hundreds of people. And there's a guy on a podium with a microphone. And all these people are gathered around. And he's saying something. We're getting closer. Okay, we got this float from such such Texas sponsor. Blah, 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 and it's got 45 people in it. And, and this is the Brenham High School Choir. And, they, blah, blah, blah. and I said, oh. <laughs> Please don't be reading from that form. <laughs> Please, that can't be. I told Hannah, I said, oh no, he can't be reading from that form. And now we have, everybody's playing. And they're going on by. And sure enough, we get in front of this deal, in front of the entire crowd, and that guy, he said it. I thought maybe he had helped me out, but he didn't. And now we have Han and Dad on a horse. <laughs> I mean, at least I could have put the horse's name or something. Oh, gosh, I was... We were, both of us, we were like... <laughs> that's, that's, that's back here. There are people back here. That was oh, man. 
And I'll never forget, because Rachel and them, they were running, to because they heard all this announcement. They were running up there, they couldn't hear. And so I'll never forget it. They ran up, and, and Rachel goes, man, I asked Mom when I heard that announcer, I said, I wonder what they said about Dad. <laughs> I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> Or you'll change your last name. I mean, it's just a very, nobody around. You know what? I didn't take that form very serious. Because I had no idea, one, that was going to be read out loud to front to the whole place. I had, you know, took a little more time and effort and energy. I'd have put sponsored by Believers Fellowship or something. I'd have, put, I'd have done something. But I did after I heard it. And you know, if you know the Lord, one day you're going to stand before God and God is going to look at your faithfulness and how you served Him faithfully and He's going to judge you and me at the Bema Seat of Judgment based on our works, not to get saved, but what we did for Christ since we've been saved in front of the crowd and you may not take that form seriously now, but on that day, at that minute, it'll be the most important form thing that you ever did in your life. At that moment. I know a lot of people... When I, at one time in my life, I was backslidden when I used to say this, well, at least I'll be there. That's probably about the most backslidden statement a person could make. That I'm just going to, at least I'm there. That's not going to hold water on that day. And we need to reexamine that now. And the second thing that's up on the board is you've got to focus on its future impact. This kingdom stuff is going to have some future impact that's going to be out of this world that we are going to be held responsible for. Let's have a hypothetical situation. You know, coming from the school business, you know, we have in school, we they have what's called report cards. You know what the purpose of a report card is? I mean, they could just wait till you finish the whole class and then say, oh, here's what you made. But administrators say, well, kids ought to know at least earlier on that here's what I did this semester and here's what I did this semester or here's what I did this nine weeks. Here. Why? So that you don't wait to the very end to find out you failed the class. You can find out how you're doing when the report card comes. And then administrators even had a better idea. They said, let's even let them know earlier. And so, we, so administrators came up with what was called the progress report. That's so that you'll know the progress of how your kid's doing even before they get the report card, even before they get the next report card, and even before they finish the entire class. That's a great invention, wasn't it? Because why wait to the very end and say, you failed? You said, I thought I was doing pretty good. Let's just hypothetically say that to every church in America, God sent the books that would show what's going to be read if it was read today about our faithfulness in his kingdom. And he mailed them to every church and he called them the kingdom's progress report. Announce this to your congregation member by member so they'll know how they're doing now so they won't be surprised on that day when they're at the Bema. And the list only contains people that are saved because that's the only people that'll be at the Bema. The other will be at the great white throne. And so let's say I've got that book here. I'm setting it down here on the podium. We're going to have an invitation, a word of prayer first, and then I'm going to read them. And so we're all praying. Well, you can't wait. And so during the prayer, you sneak up. One of you sneak up. And you open that little book. And while we're all got our head closed, you find your name and you see, and let's say God grades on the 100 scale like we do in school. And so you look at what you get and you look there next to your name, 95. Yes, I am doing good. Close. And none of us saw you and you get back to your deal and so the amen. And then I begin to open the book. And so I read each person progress report from God, not, not us on how well he sees you doing for his kingdom. Well, you can hear the air conditioner now, can't you? <laughs> and so I call your name. And I say, out of 100 points, you're at 25. And you stand up, wait, no, 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 that's wrong. How's that wrong? You said, 
I got to confess, while you were praying, I went up there and I looked at my name and I saw a 95. And I know I was looking next to my name. And I said, well, you don't realize that when he sent us our report, the first part of the book was your score on how well you're doing on your kingdom. And you're doing quite well. Your house is 95. You've got a nice house and you're working well on it. And your job and your money, you're doing 95. Your vacations, 95. Your lifestyle, 95. Your electronics, 95. Your possessions, 95. Your free time, 95. You're doing great for your kingdom, 95. You're doing fantastic. You're giving to your kingdom. Boy, it's just... But your score for my kingdom is only a 25. And that's what it would be if you faced me today. But the book also says at the very end, praise, not, praise God, we're not doing it today. You've got time, and I've got time, because that's part of the kingdom. Pull up there on the screen, we've got Revelation 4.10. Hopefully I'll just pull up the first part, that's okay. The 24 elders, which are the church, that's, we don't have time to go into why that's just the church, but it is. We'll fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. When you get judged on that beam of seat, you're going to be, I believe you're going to be given crowns. And I believe those are the crowns that the church is laying before the feet of Christ. And you may say, that's not going to be a big deal to me if I just have one or I've just... It's just like that form. It will be a big deal. You are standing in the presence of your Lord and Savior who died on a cross and was beat and ripped and had his flesh ripped off his back and was nailed with nails on his hands and feet and there he is and you have nothing or I have nothing to present to him... On that day, it will be a big, big deal. It will have a future impact that should change us today. Do you know why doctors go through all they get through to be doctors? I mean, you've got to understand, when you say, I want to be a doctor, you're saying four years of college and then four years of med school and then three or four years of residency and then internship. You're, I mean, you're looking at a 10-year trial. You're looking at a 10-year path when you make that little statement. So you better be buckled down. But for, what, what the person does is they don't look here. They look down there. And they say, that's what I want to be doing. So I have to back up 10 years and buckle down to get to that point. Because if they didn't look at the future, they couldn't do all of that work to get to there. That's the same way with this event. If you really do, and I really do believe that that's going to happen, because it's in the Bible, and those crowns are going to be crowns that we'll give to Christ, I have to look there and then back up and say, that's going to make a difference on how I live today. Until the day either he comes back or he calls me home. Do you realize how this prayer started? It didn't start this way. My Father which art in heaven. It started this way. Our Father which art in heaven. Why couldn't it have started the other way? Why couldn't it have said my Father? Jesus is saying it and he's our Father too. Do you know in that prayer, that little short prayer, there are four hours in there, O-U-R-S. And there's two times he uses us. So far, four hours and two us is, 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 whatever that is. Why did he use that? Why couldn't he just said, my Father which is in heaven, my debts, my debtors? Because he wanted us to know how important the church was. This is a team effort, being part of a church, not part of, but being in a church saying, I want to serve the Lord for our Father and finding out how I can serve and I can be an asset
to his kingdom. Because everybody ought to be knowing what part is their part in the kingdom. Why don't you go to your employer tomorrow and say, you know what, what am I supposed to be doing around here? Will everybody do that tomorrow? Go to your boss and say, what am I supposed to do here? I know, I know I'm hired here, but I've never really figured out what I need to do here. He may say, you need to be fired is what you need to be doing. If you ain't figured that out now. But you, nobody would go to their employer and say, I don't know what I need to be doing. Would they? No. But the tragedy that this kingdom is so important that we would not find out from the Lord, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be doing? And we stand before God and we ask that question. I'd have done some, but I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. His kingdom. Jesus said, I want my kingdom to come. Pray that, he said. Pray my kingdom come and that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those were from the words of Jesus. That's what I want. And if his kingdom means that much to him, I need to be busy about his kingdom work and not just saying, at least I'll be there. God gives us these little progress reports, I think, so that we're able to say, Lord, I need to, I need to just be busy about your work. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet. You know, this morning.